Mm-hmm. Okay, let me set the phone down so I can have a hand to write with. Hold on. The weird thing is I've redone problem 19, and I know, I'm pretty sure, I know I've done problem 18. I've redone both of them multiple times. Okay. Yeah, and I keep getting the same wrong answer. So, you're sure it's wrong? Let me see if I can look at it. Let me make sure I'm writing it correctly. It's AX minus DY equals what? S? Equals S. And then the second equation is BX plus WY is equal to K. Yes. What's that W and the D next to S and K? Why, why, is, why is there a W right there and a D right there? Is that part of it? That was for me to cancel out D, Y, and W, Y. Oh, okay. So that's that's not part of the problem. Oh, uh, no. That's, that's, that's what I was talking about. Okay. And the problem here is just to solve for X in terms of D, K, S, and W, and B. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So you added the two equations, correct? Yes. And then you factored out the X, so it was A plus B. And when we add these, we get plus factor out a Y, and we get W minus D. And over here, I get S plus K. Yes. So now I'm going to move the Y term over and divide everything by A plus B. So X is going to be S plus K minus a YW minus a YD, all divided by A plus B. Why do you have... What happened to your Y? Your X doesn't have any Y in it. You yeah, canceled yeah. them out, but one is a W and the other is a D. Well, wait, but what I did earlier, I had the W on the top and the D on the bottom because that makes a negative DWY and then plus a DWY. We still can't oh, so you're multi I see what you're doing. You're multiplying everything by W. But that doesn't give a WDY. In other words, how, oh, I see. You, oh, you multiplied the top by W and you multiplied the bottom by D. Yes. Okay. Uh, Let me see what happens if I do that. Uh, I'm not sure what's wrong with the way I did it. It's fairly straightforward. Um, but I'm not sure how you're going to get rid of the Y. Uh, in other words, you've got your answer in terms of D, W. Let, let me see what happens if I do that same thing. Here, let me... Erase what I've got here. Sorry. My eraser doesn't always work quite right. So here's what you did. You multiplied the left side by W and the right side by W. And up here, you multiplied the left side by D and the right side by D. Okay. And now you added the two, correct? So you got WAX plus DBX. Minus DWY plus DWY equals SW plus KD. Yeah. 
you're right. The dwy and the plus dwy go away, and so you end up with x times wa plus db equals all of that. So your answer should be sw plus kd divided by wa plus db. And that's yeah. what you have. DK plus SW over AW plus BD. How do you know yours is wrong? Um, because I, I'm very, very sure that 18 is right. But when, so the book has the answers uh -huh. in the back. It has the answers to the odd numbers. So cool. 19 said, use the result of problem 18 to solve for X. And... Okay. So right here, um, I, I did what I thought was right, and then I came up with an answer completely different than what the back of the book said, and the back of the book said x equals 5. Well, hmm, what is going on with this problem? First of all, where'd you get the idea to multiply the top by W and the bottom by D? Just that that was your idea? Well, that's how he, he taught us. He did, okay. Um, yeah. I guess, yeah, okay, I, I get that. And, and what you're doing is multiplying by the, uh, in other words, if that was a 5 and that was a 7, you'd multiply the top by 7 and you'd multiply the bottom by 5. So I get that that is going to allow you to eliminate the W. Okay, so you get X equals that. Now, does that allow you to solve for Y? I think it does. Let's see what happens if we solve for Y. So X equals that. And so, let's see, if I go down here below, I'm going to have B times, gosh, it's hard to imagine that this is going to simplify, but who knows. So that's X. And, hmm, I guess I can solve for y because that's, let's see, the, the first equation is, oh, I'm using the second equation, bx. So that's bx plus wy equals k. There's my equation. In other words, once I substitute my solution for x into this equation number 2, the original equation number 2, not the one that's been multiplied by w and d, um, now I basically could solve for y. y is going to be k minus that whole thing all divided by w. But yeah. now, what am I going to do? Where where'd this function come from that's written here? Which, what do you mean? On 19, where'd the 3x minus 5y equal 10? And that's 4x the, plus 2y equals 22. That's the problem. Um, that's why I'm solving for x. Well, why does that have anything to do with 18? So what he said was... Um, I don't need 18 to solve 19. I can solve 19 as a system of equations. There's two equations yeah. and two variables. Um, well, one thing that you said is take 18, take that first, uh, well, take that first, those two first equations of 18. Right. And treat them as if they were 19. So, like, 
A would be 3, and then D would be negative 5, and then S would be 10. Okay. Ah, and then plug those back into that. In other exactly, words, yeah. here's what he's saying. B would be 4, W would be yeah, 2. Yeah, okay. So, A equals 3. Yeah. D equals minus 5. No? Uh -huh. No? It's minus dy, so d is plus 5. Why would it be plus 5, though? Well, because it's ax minus dy, and this is 3x minus 5y, so d is 5. Okay. Okay. B is 4. And W is plus 2. So now if I try to solve for X using all of those, do I have everything? Uh, not quite. Let's see. Uh, S is 10. And K is 22. So now I can use your formula over here, and let's see what I get. I get x equals d times k, that's 110, plus s times w, that's 20. And I'm going to divide it by aw, which is 6, plus bd, which is a plus 20. And that gives me 130 over 26, which is 5. I think the only mistake you made was you made D a minus 5, not a plus 5. Well, oh, that would be it, and that's what I got, that's got me in a big trouble. Yeah, now, so they just gave you this, okay interesting exercise because we could have solved this without 18 at all. In other words, that's just a standard simultaneous equations with two variables. You, you would be able to solve that easily. So this is kind of a different take on it where they don't give you the coefficients. They make you solve for x in terms of a bunch of variables. And then they give you the two equations which tell you all six of those variables. Yeah. So it's definitely an interesting look at how to do some of these. All right. What else? Um, I'm thinking, so actually this, this 20 right here, I think you can see at the bottom of the picture. Okay. Let me scroll um, up here. Whoops. I forgot I can write on that thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, okay. Uh, I don't, okay, so I'm, I'm seeing the problem. Here, let me write it. It's just, is this thing, whole thing equal to some number? Am I missing part of the equation? No, that, that's all it gave us. It just said solve. No, there's no equation. You can't solve if there's no equation. I'm wondering if it's supposed to be equal to zero. Yeah, sorry, I just looked at the book, it says equals zero. Okay. Within the unit circle. In other words, they don't want all of the answers out to infinity, they just want the two answers in the unit circle. Yes, exactly. All right, let's have a look here. Well, if we try our first... identity. What, what is that? If we try the first identity for tangent, which is sine over cosine, what I want to try to do is get everything in terms of one trig function. When you're solving trig equations, that's the goal. I don't want tangents and sines and cosecants. I want everything in terms of one trig function. So, if I do this, what do I get? I get 2 sine squared of x 
plus sine of x all over cosine of x. And that's equal to zero. Correct? Now, whenever you have a fraction equals zero, there's only one way that can be, and that is if the numerator is equal to zero. So I don't care about the denominator being cosine. I can just, I can make the following statement, that this numerator has to equal zero. Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to factor it. Let me make some room here. What's the greatest common factor I can take out? X. Or sine X. Sine X. And there's a difference. You can't really take X out. You can't separate that X from the sine function. And this leaves 2 sine X plus 1. And since all of that's 0, then there are going to be these places. That can be 0. Or the second one can be 0, which means sine of x is going to equal minus 1 half. Did you, fit, did you get how I got both of those? Well, how come we have sine x times 2 sine x plus 1 equals 0? Mul multiply, very... multiply those two back together and you get what we started with. Correct? Yeah, I thought we started with the tangent x. We did. Well, let's go back here. We started with tan x, and in place of tan x, I used sine over cosine. So all of a sudden, I had sine over cosine multiplied by that number. And what that gave me was what I've got check marked here over cosine x. Okay. Okay. In other words, there's a cosine x in the denominator. But the fact is, it doesn't matter what's in the denominator. The only way this function can be equal to zero is if the numerator is equal to zero. So I can cross off that cosine x and say just the numerator has to be equal to zero. Uh-huh. Sure. If I were to go up here to the right, if I tell you uh, x, x over z equals 0, multiply both sides by z, and you get x equals 0. There's uh -huh. only one way that can be true, and that is if the numerator is equal to 0. It does not matter what the denominator is. So the same logic holds in this problem. I can state that the numerator has to be equal to 0. Then I'm going to solve that much like I would solve any polynomial. I'm going to factor out a greatest common factor. And then I'm going to set each factor equal to zero. And now if sine x has to be equal to zero, well, where does that occur in the unit circle? Um, that. Two places in the domain they've given us. Notice the domain they've given us is 0 up to 2 pi, not counting 2 pi. Yeah. So where's one place where the sine of x is equal to 0? Um, 0 degrees. Where's another place in, um, in the unit circle? Picture the sine curve. 180 degrees. Uh-huh. So there's the two places that it's equal to zero. And now give me two places where sine x is equal to negative one half. Um, sine of x is equal to neg uh, negative one half uh, would be 330 and 210. Correct. There's your four answers. 2 for x and 2 for this x. In other words, if I plug any of these four answers into my original equation, it's going to be true. And let's try it. If x is 0, well, the tan of 0 is 0, so that works. If 
x is 180, uh, the tan of 180 is also 0. So that works. If I look at my two lower answers, I get 210 and 330. Well, the tan of 210 is 1 over root 3. But the sine of 210, the sine of 210 is minus 1 half. So this term goes to 0 when x is 210. You with me? Yeah. Sine of, two, sine of 210 is minus 1 half. 2 times minus 1 half is minus 1. Minus 1 plus 1 is 0. If this term in parentheses yep. is zero, then the whole thing works. Uh -huh. And finally, our last solution was 330. Same thing. The sine of 330 is going to be minus one half. Yeah. So your first two answers, tan of x goes to zero. Your next two answers, these, the second term goes to zero. Now, incidentally, Justin, I, I do record this, so you, if you're concerned about taking notes or something uh, as we go, uh, you probably don't need to do that unless you want to. If you feel like it helps your learning of it, you certainly can do it. But I almost think that the best way is to give your full attention to what we're doing on my screen. Then, if you want to go back over and watch the recording of it, you can watch that yeah. recording in high speed. In other words, you can fast forward to a question. You don't have to watch the whole hour. You, you could watch yeah. just part of it. Okay. Okay. So that might be the better way to proceed when we're online. I don't know. I get some students that absolutely insist that they learn the best when they take notes during the lecture or the session. And gotcha. so if you're one of those, feel free to do that. All right, what else do we got here? We got 21, I can't quite read. Um, either you need to take a picture or just verbalize 21. What's 21 say? I think I, got, I, think I actually got 21. Can I, do, can I read you off number 23 because I don't really get that one? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so it says arc tan. Okay. And then in like brackets, it has tangent parentheses negative 120 degrees parentheses bracket. They want you to give the answer? Yeah, it just wants me to okay. give the answer. There's two types of problems here. There's this kind. And then there's this kind, where we take the tangent of an inverse tangent. Yeah. And maybe the inverse tangent is 1, OK? Oddly enough, we solve these two problems completely differently. Your problem on the left, you're allowed to use a calculator, right? Uh, well, I am a, he doesn't want us to, he wants us to have memorized everything. Okay. So, the problem no. on the right, you don't need a calculator for, and I'll show you how to do that. Let's okay. take the problem on the right, first of all. Because this problem on the right, you're going to get some of these also. Where you have the okay. trig function in front, and you have the inverse trig function in the middle, and they don't necessarily have to be the same. How come we can do the tangent times the, well, why is the one on the right, why is that one? I'll show you. Well, because I made it up. In other words, I made up the problem. Um, yep. Let's just ignore your problem for the moment and look at this problem on the right. All right. The most important thing to begin here is to recognize that the inverse tangent of that argument is an angle. That's what it is, is an angle. 
Uh, so it's useful to look at that problem as what is the tangent of theta? Well, if I now draw a triangle, a right triangle, and I label theta, well, this tells me that the tangent is 1 over 1. In other words, I can dimension those two sides of that triangle based on what's inside the bracket. Now, I can complete the dimensioning of the triangle using the Pythagorean theorem. Now, I can figure out what the tangent of theta is. It's 1 over 1 without ever figuring out what theta was. In other words, I did not need to figure out theta. And in fact, notice that if the problem said, what's the sign of that, you're going to probably get problems like this, where there are different trig functions. Well, now I know that the sine of theta is 1 over root 2. And again, I do not need to figure out theta. I can give you all six trig functions. Once, once you've got a triangle here, and I know that we're in first quadrant because the argument of the inverse tan was a positive number, uh -huh. I can give you all six trig functions of theta without knowing theta. Okay? Problem on the left is a little different. First of all, let's figure out what the tan... Problem on the left, we are going to solve for that because it's a number. It's not an angle. Then we're going to take the inverse tan of that number to figure out the angle that they're asking for. So let's work from the inside. Don't need a calculator to figure out the tan of minus 120. Uh huh. Um, so that's the same as the tan of 60. We know it's going to be a positive number because we're in the third quadrant, right? Minus 120 is the third quadrant? Yeah. So we know whatever number we're going to come up with is going to be positive. So let's just figure out the tan of 120, which is the same as the tan of 60. The tan of 60 is root 3. So that is root 3. What's that? Oh, actually, I had something that we're good. Okay. Now, the problem is relatively easy. I want to figure out the inverse tan of root 3. Well, that's clearly a positive angle. So what's the answer? Um, uh, root 360 degrees? 60. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. In other words, notice it doesn't automatically become that. A lot of people feel like it should, but it doesn't. And uh -huh. it has everything to do with the fact that when I say inverse tan of a positive argument, I'm in the first quadrant. If I say inverse tan of a negative argument, I'm in the fourth quadrant. So the fact that they started you out in the third quadrant was going to make things tricky because yeah. that gives you a positive number because tangent's positive in the third quadrant. But then when you go to find the inverse tan of that positive number, you get thrown back into the first quadrant. Yeah. All right. So... This problem, notice, we did significantly different than something that looks really similar. This problem over here, I'm going to draw a triangle. I'm going to dimension it. I'm never going to solve for theta, and I'm still going to be able to tell you what the sine of theta is, cosine of theta, cotangent of theta, all of them. So there's two very distinct problems. One, if you have the inverse at the beginning, then you solve for the middle first. The other, if you have the trig function in front, then you draw a triangle and you dimension it. You don't really solve that because normally that might be a calculator problem, and we don't want a calculator problem. 
let's say I had the inverse tan of four sevenths. Okay? Let's go back over to the right. If I had this problem right here, I don't need a calculator, even though four sevenths is a number that I can't possibly figure out without a calculator, here's how I'm going to do it. I know that tangent is opposite over adjacent, so that's got to be four and seven. And now this has got to be the square root of six, let's see, 49, 49 plus 16, that's the square root of 65. Now the sine of theta is four divided by the square root of 65. So I can do these kind of problems, and I don't need standard angles to do it. To do these yeah. kind of problems over here, you got to give me all the angles in multiples of 30, 45, or 60, or 90. Otherwise, I can't do it without a calculator. I can do this without a calculator all day long, even though we're not, theta is not a common angle. Yeah. All right. What else you got? You got more like this? Um, Do a mixture of uh, these? Uh, yeah. I got I have one. That, that's all we need. It's always good once I've explained how to do a certain type problem. If you've got a another one that you can try to do and make sure you know how to do it. Um, this one, it's this one's actually twenty-four. Okay. This one says cosecant squared. Um, parentheses negative three pi over two. Plus tangent cubed four pi. <laughs> They're funny. Tangent of four pi is zero. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so that one's gonna be zero. <laughs> uh, and then minus sine squared times negative three pi over two. Negative three pi over two. Yeah. Okay. So let's evaluate each one of these functions and do what they say. In other words, let's figure out what cosecant of minus 3 pi over 2 is. We'll take that number and square it. Then okay. we'll come up with an answer. So first of all, cosecant is reciprocal to what? Cosecant is reciprocal of uh, sines. Okay. So it's really... 1 over the sine squared of minus 3 pi over 2. Yeah. Okay. Now, just down here, I'll draw a sine curve, just because we have so many of these angles. 3 pi over 2 is right there. What's the sine of 3 pi over 2? The sine of 3 pi over 2? Uh... Look at, look at the curve. Forget the negative in front of it for the moment. 270? 3 pi over 2 is 270, but what's the sign of that? In other words, they're looking for this value right there. Remember, the, remember this is the, ver the y-axis, so negative 1. And yeah. notice that I don't care if it's negative 1 or positive 1 because I'm going to square it. Yeah. So this term turns into 1. This term, well, the tangent of 0 is 0. So therefore, the tangent of pi is 0, the tangent of 2 pi is 0, 3 pi, 4 pi. So I don't care what it is, 0 cubed is 0. Now, minus, well, we just did that. We know that is 1. Right? Yeah. The sine is actually a negative 1, but we're squaring it. And besides that, it started out as negative 3 pi over 2, so that actually becomes a positive 1, believe it or not. In other words, the sine... Here, down here, the sine of negative 3 pi over 2 
Remember that is an odd function, so it's the same as negative sine of 3 pi over 2. Yeah. So if the negative confuses you, don't let it. And then as all you got to do is figure out that, well, that's negative 1, but now it's negative times negative 1, so that whole thing is positive 1. But it wouldn't have mattered whether it was positive or negative because they're having us square it anyway. But that is 1. And then squared, it's still 1. And 1 over 1 is 1. So that whole thing is 1. So the answer to this problem is 0. 0. Mm -hmm. one, 1 plus 0 minus 1. This is the, uh, my pencil stopped working all of a sudden. What happens when that happens? I don't know. Uh, hmm. Yeah, in fact, my cursor stopped working too. Uh, hold on a minute. Let me try this as a fact. Let me go back. Open up your page and see if I can write on it. Wondering if it was just my drawing pad. No, it's my whole drawing pad it needs to be plugged, unplugged, and plugged back in. Let me do that real quick. Hold on a second, Justin. It's being unplugged. Try plugging it in at the front. Oh, now it says my audio connection has been lost. Well, we never had it to begin with, right? Can you still hear me, Justin? Wow, I'm to our phone audio. Justin? I can hear you, sir. Okay, sorry. I thought maybe we... <laughs> right when I lost the audio with you, my go-to-meeting says your audio connection has been lost. Really? Uh-huh, which was very odd. Uh, hold on a second. Why is this acting up? Restored. Down. Uh, okay. Everything just slowed down for a minute. I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, I can write again. All right. Technology is wonderful, but every now and then it hiccups. Yeah, that's true. All right. So what's the next thing you got? Well, let's see. We started at about, uh, we got about 15 minutes. I believe we started at about 9.45. Yeah. Okay. I, guess. I think so. Okay. I have an 11 today, believe it or not. In fact, I, I've got appointments all day. This is the busiest Sunday I've had in a long time. Really? Yeah. I got one guy in Florida that's got a major exam and he's doing like seven sessions in four days. So he's, wow. he's really keeping me busy. All the way from Florida. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I've got actually three students in Florida that found me on online. Not not from my children that live in Florida or not from any referrals. Well, one was a referral from the other, but yeah, I, I picked up one student from Florida, and she actually referred a couple of students to me that now I see wow. regularly online. It's terrific. That is, yeah, that is pretty nice. <coughs> All right, so what else you got? Uh, what else do we got? I have a... Uh, let's see, my number 25 is... It says if f of x equals secant squared x. <coughs> okay. And g of x equals tangent squared x. <coughs> okay. Find f minus g of 510. Of a what? Of 510. 510? Yes, 510. 510. Okay. That's what it was. 
Okay. Five ten and degrees, I take it? Yes. Okay. I had that problem once before with you when they had ten. I thought it was in radians. Normally, yeah, normally uh, if there's no degree symbol, then it's taken to be radians, especially if you're yeah. dealing with trig functions. But if there's a degree symbol, and they don't put that degree symbol on your problems, I noticed that very first time. Oh, no. So what we need is F minus G, so the answer is pretty straightforward. It's secant of 510 squared minus the tangent of 510 squared. Okay, now that's outside the unit circle, so convert it to a unit circle angle. Uh, one second. What's that? I was talking about something. Okay. What what's the five ten angle the equivalent of in the unit circle? What's its co um, that's co the equivalent of Okay, so I'm going to cross that out, and I do mean cross it out. In other words, this whole problem is exactly the same if we use 150. Oh, wow. It's not, it's not like a reference angle. I'm not doing that. I'm just getting it inside the unit circle. All trig functions of coterminal angles are the same. Okay, so uh -huh. secant of 150 is 1 over what? It'd be 1 over the cosine squared of 150. Okay. And now, let's solve that. What is the reference angle for cosine of 150? Be negative root 3 over 2. Well, okay. The reference angle is 30. So I'm finding the cosine of 30, which you're right, negative 3 over 2. It's in the second quadrant, so it's definitely negative, but I'm squaring it. So now I have 1 over 3 over 4, which is 4 over 3. You with me? Oh, yes. I'm with you. Okay. Now let's go do tangent. What's the tangent of 150? What's that reference angle? So, the, it would still be 30 degrees, right? Correct. Only this time I don't replace the 30 to the 150, because that wouldn't be correct. The 150 and the 510 are identical. The 150 and the 30, the 30 is just the reference angle. I'm going to come up with the number based on the 30, and then I'm going to come up with the sign based on it's in the second quadrant, but I don't really care about the sign because I'm squaring it anyway. So let's just come up with a number. We don't have to worry about its quadrant even. Okay. It's the um, tan of thirty. So it would be one. It would be one half over negative root three over two. No. Tan of thirty. If I draw a thirty sixty triangle. That's 1, that's root 3, that's 2, what's the tan of 30? 1 over root 3, which would be Square root 3 it? over 3. Which is what? Root 3 over 3. Don't rationalize it. Oh, okay. In this case, because you're squaring it. Because it's really easy to rationalize it, since we're going to square it, it's going to turn into 1 over 3. It's much oh, yeah. easier to square that if you don't rationalize. That's why I said don't rationalize. So it's 4 thirds minus 1 third equals 1 is the answer. Why do we use the tangent of 150? Why wouldn't it be a negative 1 third? It would. It is. But we're squaring it. So if it starts out negative, by the time you square it, it becomes positive. So that's why I didn't care what the sign was on these numbers. 
I didn't care what quadrant we were in. It was either going to be positive or negative, and when we square it, it's always going to be one-third. Now, before we leave this problem, are you, are you understanding everything we did? Oh, this is way better than that. This is, this is pretty good. I, I like this. Okay. No, I mean, you understand so far everything we've done on that problem? I do. I do. Okay. Now let's go back and let me show you something else about this problem. What is the Pythagorean identity involving tangent and secant? Involving tangent and secant? Uh-huh. Well, they're both over cosine. No. There's the identity right there. Just like sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, uh -huh. tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared. So notice, I didn't have to do any work at all if I'd have used this. I'd have just subtracted tangent squared from both sides, and I'd have known that that's equal to 1 regardless of the angle. Wouldn't matter if the angle was 5, 10, or 10. The secant squared of any angle minus the tangent squared of that same angle is always equal to 1. It's just like sine squared plus cosine squared. It doesn't matter what the angle is. It always adds to 1. Okay. So we did it the hard way by using 510. If I had just used the trig identity, I would have had the answer in 10 seconds. Yeah, I think the problem though with my teacher, he would have, he would have made me do it the way that we did it. We just did it earlier. I'm not so sure of that. I think your teacher would have been so impressed that you recognized the trig identity that he would have given you full credit on it. Maybe not, but certainly worth pointing out to him that secant squared minus tangent squared is always one. Yeah. So it doesn't matter the angle. And certainly if I had a student that told me that, I would say go for it. You don't need to, you don't need to figure out the angle. Although maybe the purpose of this exercise was to prove to you that at one angle it's one. Now a good second problem would be, okay, do the same thing, only use an angle of 45 degrees. And you're still going to get one. All right, what else you got? What else I got? Um, let's see, what else? <laughs> oh, uh, I have, let's go with, okay, my number, uh, it's number 26. It's 2LN. X minus one equals ln times three x minus five. Okay. And I just said solve for x. Okay. How are we going to do that? Notice that if I had this equals this, then I could just equate the arguments, right? Yeah. But I got a pesky 2 that's in front of this natural log on the left. How do I get rid of that 2? Do I divide by 2? Then I'll have a 2 on the right. It's a better way to get rid of it. Think of your properties of logs. That leading coefficient can be taken to the exponent and placed right there. So then ln equals x minus 1 squared. Correct. That's the same as 2 ln of x minus 1. Or it's whatever coefficient is in front of an ln can be taken as the exponent of the argument. Now I've got to expand it which becomes x squared minus 2x plus 1. 
And now I can equate the two arguments because I've got just ln. In other words, it's okay to think of dividing both sides by ln here. Although that's not really what you're doing, it's not even close to what you're doing. What you're doing is you're taking the natural log of this function and you're saying it's equal to the natural log of this other function. Therefore, those two functions must equal one another. But it's certainly not correct. Notice that if we'd have started this problem out by dividing both sides by ln, we would have not got the right answer. That 2 would not have been in the right spot. Okay. Now what am I going to do to solve this? Uh, well, I just subtract 3x and then add 5 on each side. Leaving 0, and now what? And then that would be x minus 2 times x minus 3 equals 0. Okay. And finally, x equals 2 and x equals 3. There's your answers. And you can try, ah, let's check both of those. Because remember, we started with a log equation. And when I come up with two answers for a log equation, Frequently, one of them violates the domain. Neither one of them do here. Notice that when x is 2, I got the natural log of 1, which is 0, equals the natural log of 1, which is also 0. Yes. And when x equals 3, I've got the natural log of 2 squared, which is 4, and on the right side, I got the natural log of 9 minus 5, which is 4. So both solutions work, which is very unusual. Most of the time, when you come up with two solutions with a log equation to start with, one of those solutions is going to violate the domain. So you throw it, it out. Does it always violate it if it's negative? Well, it violates it if that's 0 or negative. In other words, if I had to come up with an x of 1, that violates the domain. You cannot take the natural log of 0. It's an imaginary number. Yeah. Also, this would have been negative if I had to come up with an x of 1, because 3 minus 5 would be minus 2. But you can't yeah. even have 0. Okay. Okay. All right. That sounds like a good place to stop. Justin, um, I give me your email address so that I can send you. Oh, I have it. Just a second. Yeah, you just sent me pictures, so I have your email address. As soon as this thing gets processed, I will uh, send you a link to see the recording. And the recordings will always be in the same place. So save that link. It's a YouTube channel. But your recordings will have your initials, J-A, and the date. So today's file name will be J-A-0430017. And every time we do a session online, the next morning I'll post it to the same channel. Now, I'm perfectly happy coming back and doing it in person. You, you live 10 minutes away. So I'm not pushing online. It's your choice. You and your dad's. It's a little cheaper online. It's only 32 an hour instead of 40. But I actually think it's superior because, for one thing, they're all recorded. You get to go back and review if you forget what we, if you forget what we did on a particular problem. I think I agree. I like it. I like the online a little bit more. Okay. Well, you can keep me posted as to which way you want to go. I'm, I can go either way, either in person or online. But uh, I, I'll let you and your dad work it out. And I don't think you have anything scheduled. 
uh, I still owe you at least one session, maybe more, because your dad paid me for an in-person session, and our online session was $8 less. So, and then we missed Friday night. So you got at least one session coming. Okay? All right, Justin. Talk to you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Oh, to close out your go to meeting, just hit the X in the upper right corner of the go to meeting panel, and then that'll close out the go to meeting. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye.